I greet you in Jesus' name. In the world we live in today, people are so much concerned with acquiring things. People are so much concerned with education. When you apply for a job today, you attach your CV, your curriculum vitae, which uh, represents you in terms of what you have achieved in life, which elaborates uh, your qualifications. I stand here today to present a curriculum vitae of a man. I have looked and I've heard of obituaries of great men. In their obituaries, they tell us of how these men have done their things in life, of great things that they have achieved. I stand here to compare and contrast the achievements of a man and the achievements of the greatest men of this world today. The man I'm talking about here is none other than Jesus. You see, in Jesus' CV, his name is called Jesus. Why Jesus? Matthew 1 verse 21. For the virgin shall have a child, and his name shall be called Jesus. For he shall save people from their sins. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus, Beth, was prophesied. It was predicted before he was born. Mary was told that he was going to have a child. And because he was not going to be carrying an ordinary child, this child's birth was predicted. This child's birth was prophesied. I have looked at kings of this world, the presidents of our countries. Not even one of them had his birth prophesied. So it puts Jesus as a distinct king, a king above kings. A virgin shall have a child, something which doesn't happen in the world that we live in. A child is a product of two people. But here we see a virgin having a child. And the child's name is called Jesus, for he shall save people from their sins. We have never heard a mother who knew during the pregnancy period that he's carrying a president or he's carrying a king. But Mary, because he was not carrying an ordinary child, she knew she was carrying a king who will save people from their sins. You see, brothers and sisters, the kings of this world, the greatest men of this world, have built palaces. But I'm here to present a man who is omnipresent. He, did not, he doesn't need a house to dwell in. He doesn't need a palace to dwell in because he is omnipresent. I'm presenting a king here whose name is called Jesus and whose telephone number is a prayer away. If you want to pray to him, he responds immediately. You see, with kings of this world, you have to make an appointment with them. If you want to see the President Zuma today, you must make an appointment with his secretary and they have to scrutinize the purpose of your visit. And if you are lucky, then the secretary will diarize a visit for you. But this Jesus I am talking about, you don't have to make an appointment. If you apply today in prayer, he answers prayer immediately. I'm talking about a man who did not attend any formal school. Like the kings of this world, like the greatest men that I've spoken about, who need to attend a university for them to be recognized who need to have a PhD in a particular field for them to be recognized. But I'm talking about a king here who at the age of 12, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, the Bible says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And at the age of 12, we are told that Jesus would go into the synagogue and be surrounded with doctors of law, people with PhD in law, People with PhD in philosophy will surround Jesus and learn from the master who did not attend University of uh, Northwest, who did not attend Vets University, but a man who learned from the creation itself, a man who was brought by heaven itself. I'm here to present a man who is specialized in many fields. 
I like the educated people of this world who specialize in a particular field. You see, professors, you are a professor of a particular field. Then if you are a professor in philosophy, you are not a professor in agriculture. You go to study agriculture in order for you to attain another qualification in agriculture. But the Jesus I am presenting to you today is a God who has specialized, is a man who has specialized in all fields. And he does not need bodyguards like presidents of this world. Look at them when they're traveling. They travel in motorcats. They travel, one man traveling with 100 people. He's accompanied by bodyguards because he's not sure of his safety. But the man I'm talking about here, who is called Jesus, does not need bodyguards because the tens of thousands of angels are his. They belong to him. Brothers and sisters, I present to you here a man who is experienced in all fields of, of study. I present to you, brothers and sisters, a man who knows it all. And Psalms 24, verse 1 says that the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to him. Because he has been there before the foundation of the world. I present a man, brothers and sisters, whose curriculum vitae, if it was to be written, one, one singer says, if it was his biography was to be written, if his curriculum was to be written in ink, the amount of ink that is required will be more than the waters of the oceans. I am told that over 80% of the earth is water. So if we were to use water to write about Jesus, we would finish all the water in the oceans and that won't be enough to write about him. I present a man who has specialized in creation. A man who has created man in his own image. A man who breathed the breath of life. And man became a living soul. A man who, when he's looking at you and I, he looks at the works of his hands. And he certifies and says, these are my, his, my works. Like when you visit a police station to certify a copy, they need an original. And when they look at an original, what must be there on the copy must be exactly identical with what is there on the original in order for them to certify a copy as the true origin, as, as the copy of a true original. The same is true when Jesus created man, when God created man, he certified that this one has been created in my image. And he gave man dominion over everything that is there on earth. I'm presenting to you a man whose promises are true, whose promises are not like the promises of leaders of this world, who some of them are propagandists in their nature. I'm talking of a man who is the way, the truth, and the lie. I'm presenting a man here who was presented to us when the world has sunk into sin. The Bible tells us in John 3 verse 16 that for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he sent this man, his name called Jesus. And when he was sent to the planet Earth, he was born in a manger. Teaching humanity, teaching you and I humility. Teaching you and I that it's not about you, but it's about others. A man who was sent to serve the world, not to be served. A man who decided not to live in houses built of stone. But a man who moved from place to place because he had one mission. Only one mission to seek and serve the lost. The leaders we have today, they preach peace. They preach happiness. They preach health for all. But what we have seen today is that most of them, they have no people at heart. They are up to amassing wealth for themselves. But I present a king here who came from glory to save humankind. He had no time to build a house. He had no time to amass wealth because he had you and I in his mind. He had therefore to focus on such matters which was seeking and serving the lost. My brothers and sisters, I am talking about a man whose cattle in the thousand hills are his, but he possessed not even one head of cattle because his mission was about the salvation of you and I. I present to you a man, brothers and sisters, who traveled the whole world where no place to put his head. I present a man here who does not need a medium to travel, who can travel even faster than the speed of light. I am told that light can travel in a vacuum, and I'm told that light can travel at a speed of three times 10 to the exponent of eight meters per second. But this man that I'm presenting, he does not need air to travel. He does not need water 
to travel. He does not need a medium to travel. He is omnipresent. If you invite him in prayer, he will be with you right now. He will answer your prayer. I'm talking about a man here who has specialized in all areas, whose curriculum vitae shows that he's a man that is specialized in all areas. Jesus Christ has specialized in all areas of study. If you want to ask and find out in which areas that Jesus has specialized in, I can give you referees which are found in the Bible. Jesus has specialized in medicine. I have had people going to train as medical doctors. They're called general practitioners. After, some, after gaining some experience, they go back to school and specialize. Some specialize in what we call gynecology. Some specialize in orthopedics. Some specialize in children and they're called pediatricians. Some specialize on the skin and they're called dermatologists. I'm talking about a man here who needed not to specialize in a particular university. If you don't believe what I'm saying, ask that man who was there for 38 years, who was crippled for 38 years, who never had the privilege of working. My Bible tells me that when Jesus, when Jesus came his way, he needed not to carry out an operation like what orthopedic surgeons do. He needed not to prescribe a particular drug. He needed not to counsel the man. Jesus needed not to find out the history about the man. You know, when you visit a doctor today, before they treat you, they will, uh, they will find the history. They will find your history. They will ask you whether there is a particular person in your family who is also having the same kind of disease that you are suffering from. Jesus needed not to do that. He said to this man, Take up your bed and walk. My Bible tells me that after 38 years, the man walked. Praise be to God. This man, brothers and sisters, he also specialized in all fields of study like fishing. You ask those men who had spent the whole night fishing, go with me to the fifth chapter. The book is Luke. Luke chapter 5. If you read from verse 1 to verse 11, they, there is an interesting story there of men, fishermen, who spent the whole night fishing. My Bible tells me in chapter 5 of Luke that this man that Jesus saw by the edge of the pot, they were fishing the whole night. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, you see, Simon, you have been fishing the whole night. This does not mean that the fish wasn't there. The fish was there, but the man did not catch even one fish. But when Jesus arrived, he tells them to cast their nets deeper. My Bible tells me that when they cast their nets deeper, the nets were full of fish, such that they were not able to retrieve the nets from the water. They had to invite friends from other boats to come and assist them. This is the Jesus that we're speaking about, who is able, brothers and sisters, to do the impossible. And having fished, the man, Jesus says to them, yes, yes, you have caught fish, but from henceforth, you are not going to be catchers of fish, but you are going to be fishers of men, only if you, you follow me. That's Jesus that we are talking about today. He is inviting us to cast our net deeper. He is inviting us while we do what we do here, to go out and fish men, to go out and tell them that Jesus is coming again. My brothers and sisters, if you don't, still don't believe that this Jesus is a savior, go with me to the book of Mark. We meet a man, the chapter is five, who was demon possessed. And the man was living in the tombs, the Bible says. And there in the tombs, the man was scratching himself, cutting himself, injuring himself. I've seen even Christians today, I've seen even pastors today, who are scared even when they preach at funerals. You see, they are timid, they are so scared of graves, they are scared of death. But this man lived in the tombs. My Bible tells me, to cut a long story short, when Jesus arrived, he cast the demons from this man. And the man was let free. This Jesus, my brothers and sisters, he is specialized in resurrection. If you don't believe it, you go to the Bible. The Bible will tell you that he died. And on the third day, he was resurrected. If you don't believe it, ask, ask Lazarus in the 11th chapter of the book of John. When Lazarus was 
in that tomb for four days. Yes, it was late because Jesus had not arrived before Lazarus died. My Bible tells me that when he arrived, when he arrived, Lazarus did not remain in the tomb. He shouted, he shouted and said, Lazarus, come forth. My Bible tells me that Lazarus came out of the tomb four days after his death. I don't know what was taking place in his body, but what I know is that when his veins, when his heart, when his lungs, when his brain heard the voice of Jesus, they heard that this voice is not the voice of the pastor who conducted the funeral of Lazarus. They heard that this is not the voices of the choir members who sang during Lazarus' funeral. But when the body and the systems of Lazarus heard Jesus saying, Lazarus, come forth, they heard that this is a unique voice. And they responded, and Lazarus came out of the tomb. My brothers and sisters, I'm talking of a man who was able to feed 5,000 men with two fishes and five loves. I'm talking about a man, brothers and sisters, who will come one day, and the Bible tells us that when he comes, the forces of nature are not going to stop him. Even when his kids and his children who lie in those graves, when they hear his voice, the graves will not keep, keep them. The Bible tells us that the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. As we know, brothers and sisters, our dead are lying in their tombs today. But when Christ shall come, when Christ shall come, because he is a professor of resurrection, the dead, the Bible tells us, will be resurrected. The living will be transformed. And together we will meet the Lord into, air, into the air. And we shall say, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. As we march into heaven. It's beyond human comprehension because the, these principles of science tell us that there is a force of gravity. But when Jesus come, Christ comes, he will overcome the force of gravity because he has control over the forces of nature. Because all the planets and all the galaxies are in his hands. He is in control. And when he comes, the dead will be resurrected. The living will be transformed. And if the Bible tells us that he will take us to a home, where we will live with him through our eternity. Hebrews 10 verse 37 tells us that. Just but for a little while, he who shall come shall surely come. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know the storms that you are going through. I don't know the trials that we are going through. But I am sure that in this world, all of us, one way or another, have gone through trials. The rich go through trials. Some of them are sick. They have doctors, but they don't get healing. All of us... As long as we live under the sun, we go through trial. The Bible tells us, yet yes, it will be for a moment. He who shall come shall surely come. Yes, the Bible tells us that suffering may endure for a night, but joy shall surely come in the morning. This is not a fairy tale. This Jesus that I have presented to you today, he shall surely come and take people to a place where there are no trials, to a place where there is no tribulation. But before he comes, you have to make a decision. Before he comes, you make to make your way straight. Like even John says that, I am the voice that is calling in the wilderness. Make your way straight. The voice is calling today that Jesus is coming. You must make your way straight so that when he comes, your name may be found in the book of life. And those who have accepted this Jesus, I have got this charge to you today that you must hold to this faith as Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 says, that we must hold on to this faith without wavering. We need to be firm and we need to stand fast in this faith. And to those who have not realized the joy of accepting Jesus, I call upon you today to accept this Jesus as your personal savior. Because their life should not depend on other things. Because all other ground is sinking sand. If your life depends on your leader, your leader will be born and will die one day. If your life depends on your witch doctor, you will visit your witch doctor one day and you will find him no more. He will find him dead. But this Jesus that we have presented to, to you today, he was there before eternity. May the good Lord help us and give us strength to follow him all the step of the way. Let us pray together. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege that, Lord, we may be called sons and daughters of your kingdom. Lord, we have heard that Jesus and only Jesus can come to our rescue. We have, Lord, ahead of the curriculum vitae of the greatest men of this world. 
But some were born and some have died. And some are yet to die. But Lord, we have presented a Jesus here who has been there throughout eternity because he's the Alpha and he's the Omega. He was there before the foundation of the world. We pray therefore today, Lord, that our hearts may accept him so that when he come in the clouds of glory, we may have a part in that kingdom and stay and live with him throughout eternity in that home of glory where there is no sickness, where there is no death, where there is peace and joy forevermore. Keep the coming of his coming in our hearts and seal the conviction of his coming in our hearts so that when that time comes, we may be found worthy of his kingdom. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.